Hello and welcome to the PyBytes Developer Tools Workshop. Be a more productive developer. This is Bob Eldeboz. And this is Julian Sequeira. Thank you for joining us. In this training, we're going to um, discuss 10 tips that will uh, make you more effective in your daily work and uh, that top-notch developers use every day. So let's uh, dive straight in, or maybe not straight in, because we have this... Uh, why, why are we doing this, Julian? Like, I think this quote resonated with us right yeah we love this quote this is all about making sure that you are encouraging you to sharpen your saw to sharpen your skills your tools your resources um having that all-encompassing view of your situation it's not just always about the motivation you've got to have the right tools to do the job uh, and that will in turn make you more productive yep so every minute every hour you invest every day in your tool set will compound over time so it's it's very important so we did a little research um asking our community what their favorite tools were and um yeah we were blown away that actually the editor was the number one tool they highlighted right julian oh yeah it was overwhelming <laughs> scrolling through the hundreds of responses we got just had vs code PyCharm. Vim, you know, you name it. There was Emacs in there. There was all sorts of stuff. So it was pretty crazy. It kind of makes sense because you're the whole day in your IDE or editor uh, writing code. So the more fluent you become um, with your editor, uh, the more you can gain. It's almost like the eighty twenty, right? Yeah. So can we can we take two seconds to mention which editor we use? <laughs> yeah, you you go first. Uh, well, no surprise, it's the one right in the middle, Vim. Sorry, everyone. We, I'm big on Vim. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's funny, right? Um, when I joined Sun Microsystems a long time ago, um, I had to. I was coerced using it, and it was so awkward. Like I was, <laughs> you should have seen me. It was just embarrassing. Like I was. Yeah, same. You couldn't exit were, out, right? Were just secretly laughing at me and still have traumas. But you know, <laughs> and it was such a steep learning curve, and it did it make sense? Um, but then you, you hit this peak and then all of a sudden the tool starts to work in your favor. And like one example is when you make a replacement or some action and you can use the dot to replay mm. to, to replay that thing. Or later on, um, you can record a macro with QQ and then do 10 steps. And then you can do like an um, add Q to play back that whole sequence of steps. It's super powerful, right? Oh so, yeah, um, automation right there, and uh, yeah, we love that editor. But of course, you know, we um, we're sure that PyCharm and, and Visual Studio can do those same things. It's just uh, with different shortcuts, right? But it's really worth it to to learn those shortcuts. Yeah, we're we're not starting an editor war here. We're just we're oh, just telling no. you. <laughs> anyway, when the principles are the same, it's just automation, yeah. right? Yep, perfect. Right, let's move on. Well, closely related to that in automation is the command line. Um, but you're a Windows user, right? How do you solve that problem? Yeah, but look, I'm Windows at home. That's fine. But, you know, at work, it's always always been Unix. So, uh, you know, the recommendation for anyone as a developer, you know, get your hands dirty with some Unix commands. So these are pretty basic ones, but, you know, LS, make do, find, you know, so on and so forth. Um, these are all commands that are just vital to be able to, to being able to navigate unix effectively so definitely get those under your belt if you have no experience yep and um with the basic unix um you can extend it to all kinds of uh tools so you have bash set Arc pro right there um very effective if you pipe them together and um, to process output from one command into uh, the other uh, but there are also some utilities um, we started using some more recently, and they're very powerful. Um, so we can do a little demo, right? Yep, let's go for it. All right. So here I'm in one of our open source projects. Um, and when I open Vim, so normally long time I would have used LS to see what's there. Uh, how do I get to certain apps inside my Django project. Well, then we um, got a great tip from somebody from the community to use FZF. And um, I put a key binding in the slides how you can integrate it with Vim. But now if I open Vim, 
I can just do um, comma T and look at that, I can start typing and here are all my apps, all my views, all my models. So it's very easy to, uh, to navigate to any file and to do it again. That's, so that's amazing. That's why I can, uh, can go very fast from one file to another and then with control I and O, uh, Vim can toggle between those files. Uh, another thing, funny story is that I was for a long time using find here, minus name, I don't know, view. What's, what's wrong with doing it this way? Well, that's cool, right? It works. <laughs> um, but maybe, oh, I have to grab my VVamp. And maybe, I don't know, I want to do some operation on it, right? With Sarks, I'm, do you remember that syntax? No, <laughs> I don't know. But basically, <laughs> I just want to uh, look into a bunch of files, um, see for, but I don't know, like the models or, but I can just use AG or AG and it's called the Silver Searcher and look at what it, what it can do. It can look inside the files for specific um, keywords or whatever you give it. And that way I don't have to just find all the files and do a pipe and then grab. It's all in one command. And it's super useful if I want to find anything case insensitive inside my project. That's cool. So this makes it very fast to go to a file based on what I need. I also, um, I also love that it shows you the line number on the left. Yeah. Yeah, so super I can go cool. with Vi user and then do plus 52 and it just jumps straight to that line, right? Now I'm at line. Yeah. 52, as you can see yeah, here. That's right? amazing. So that's, th these kind of tricks just makes you so much faster as a developer. So uh, I think that's why we chose those two to um, demo. Made a little alias AG to uh, run it with the Python flag because sometimes there are a lot of static files. And if I just want to look at numbooks in Python files, um, here you go, right? That's cool. And there are many more tools we can show, but I think these really highlight the uh, the essence, which is the time-saving aspect, right? Yep, of getting the right tools for the right job. So the other one we want to quickly look at is the how do I library or command. So this is an amazing little tool that searches Stack Overflow for you from the command line. So give it a crack. How to write a decorator. I always forget the syntax, right? Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I Pick think you can even from... say like, "Give me five answers," and just retrieves more. You know. There you go. So yeah. it picks it all up, and uh, just as handy, what I really like is it gives you that link. Yep. So it tells you which article it's from, and I like that because then if it is something that solves my problem, I can put that link into my code with a uh, comment as a comment, uh, so I always remember where I got it from. So. Good little That's tip. awesome. Yeah, and the other one, um, the last one I wanted to highlight is uh, aliases. So we use that for all kinds of things. So I always do an LT uh, everywhere, and that I'm actually running an LS minus LRTH because that gives the human megabyte size or whatever. Yeah. So that's super reading. helpful. I use it for to open my dot bash RC to quickly open my. VRC or VMRC, I use it to <laughs> sometimes That's just cool. mass I add like stuff and get, yeah, I have to be careful with Git add though. Like sometimes you don't want to add anything, but sometimes you do. And then this is just adds the file to the staging area and uh, does the commit. And then as it doesn't have a minus M, uh, it just opens in my VM editor. So it's just these little time savers, right? That shave off minutes, hours a week. Um, yeah, when they all add up. So what I will mention here before we move on is uh, for Windows, I like to use Commander, C-M-D-E-R, third-party app. You've got to download it, install it. Um, I know a lot of people mentioned Windows Subsystem Linux 2, and that's fantastic. Got no issues with that. It's just before all of that came out, I was using Commander, and uh, like an old man, I'm just stuck in my ways, and this is just what I use, and uh, couldn't be bothered going through WSL too. But what I love about Commander is it gives me just it just gives me that nice bash sort of shell. It, there's a lot of power in the settings behind the uh, behind the scenes, but at the end of the day, I'm able to do things like SSH keygen. I'm able to use SSH natively from it. Those of you who do use Windows, you know you can't just do that from the standard 
command prompt. So that's just a huge win for me. It's just got all those little Unixy type um, commands built into it. And that's why I like it. So threw that in there as well. Yeah, it's your own Windows, man. I wouldn't have figured that one out. <laughs> that was a tip from someone in the community, I think, ages ago. Ages, oh, that's ages awesome. ago. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Now, number three, version control, right? I mean, uh, have you lost your work at once in your career? <laughs> just once? Yeah. Yeah, just once. Not going <laughs> to happen anymore with Git, right? Um, no. Also, like more importantly for um, for developers, right? This Git is kind of the bridge that allows you to work together as developers on a, on a project, right? Which is a huge step. It's been huge for us. If if we didn't have Git branching, we couldn't work on PyBytes and code challenges at the same time. Uh, you know, gone are the days where you're editing the same file. It just doesn't happen. So, no, uh, no I found this super helpful. I mean, those of you listening to this, watching this, you you're familiar with Git. You would have heard about it at least. So uh, if you haven't touched it yet, this is, I mean, get on it. Get on it. Yeah. (laughs) And um, if you haven't opened a pull request, you definitely should get familiar with that process um, as a developer for open source. Um, We linked an article here, how to write a guest article for PyBytes. Uh, Of course, if you want to become a guest author, uh, by all means. Um, But even if you're uh, don't want to do that that article does show the whole flow of how to fork a repo make your own branch and um, then pull request it the changes back into the original repo for to to merge it in so i think that's that's something that needs to become second nature yeah and just for just to cover it off because we haven't mentioned it the tricks number four there git reset and gits and stashing uh these are super helpful when you realize you don't have time to finish what it is that you're doing. So my, my, uh, you know, as we all have families, kids, you know, work life, whatever it is, it's going on. If you get distracted, stash your commit, you know, and then you're capable of pulling it back later. So that's what I really, really like about it. Especially if you're working with multiple branches and you have to Mm -hmm. um, go from one to the other, maybe you're working on a bug bug fix branch and on a feature branch and you can just quickly stash your changes and uh, otherwise it doesn't allow you to change branches so that's a useful trick and uh, with the reset though um, you have the dash dash soft and dash dash hard so be careful hard just wipes everything out soft you still have the change in your staging area also with the git reset um, make sure you do that locally once you push your changes then uh, it's kind of set in stone so then you don't want to get out of sync uh, but those, yeah, those are just two tricks. Uh, there are more, but that will be a training in itself. Um, I guess just learn the tool uh, to become proficient. But it's it's one of those tools you really want to become proficient at. Exactly. Uh, we use it mostly from the command line, um, but we, uh, of course, reached out to our community and um, we got source tree and git kraken back as two GUI tools. Um, and of course, you can probably integrate it easily in PyCharm and VS Code. Yeah, I will also appreciate the pun of that name, Git Kraken. I think that's awesome. So, all right, let's move on to the next one. No taking. Want to take this one? Yeah, I'm going to jump straight into this. This is the number one dev skill. It doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter what you do. Um, you know, but we obviously will link it to dev. You need to take notes. It's just as simple as that. I won't dive into it any more than that. Take notes. It's so important. And uh, it makes you a better developer, makes you more effective, and just adds to your success. So that's my want, two sets. Do you want to tell them about our hyper-advanced note-taking system you have together? <laughs> so we currently just have a, a giant folder filled with text files. <laughs> and Goes with the and this, Yeah, and every single text file is a different topic. So it, I'm talking... If we wanted to talk about cars and take notes on cars, we'd have a cars.txt file. Uh, So for every topic, we have a, I don't know how many files we have in there at the moment, but that way we can just use things like AG and and Vim and just get straight to the file and just start taking the notes. And uh, That's how I sold it to you, right? I mean, because you were meticulously making all these folders. Dude, we have Silver Surger now, right? So we can just AG. Exactly. Yeah, I was moving a 
moving away from that windows mentality of having a folder to organize everything. It just now, um, I'm sure if you looked at it through a window management system, it would just be a big dog's breakfast of scattered files, but it's a uh, beautiful on the command line. So that's what counts. <laughs> yeah. And you know, the problem with, um, today is that there's just information overload, right? So we, we read all these books and it's hard to retain all the information. So um, we both have Kindles. Um, don't think you have to have a physical Kindle device. You can use the Kindle app as well on an iPad. Uh, mm -hmm. We find the highlight feature super helpful. Um, then you can just read a book and rest assured that your, like the key insights are saved in the cloud. And uh, yeah, we use that a lot to just um, go back to a book and actually digest what we what we've read yeah so often when you have those times oh where was that quote from if it was something you read on the kindle you can go back to what's the website is it notes.amazon yeah i think so I yeah yeah so if you go there then uh and it's linked to your amazon account your kindle they all just appear there by book and it's just this beautiful amazing um cloud tool absolutely love it yeah watch till the end i will show you how to get there in one second when an a yeah. gets so Evernote, this is something I use for certain aspects of my note taking uh, with family stuff and uh, yeah, find it handy. I think a lot of people have, um, a lot of people use that same with tools like OneNote and whatever oh. else. Um, Keisha, that's one that uh, someone in our community also mentioned. So thank you for that. Uh, but that's just another tool you can use. Yeah. You mentioned that because it's, it's very useful for uh, coach snippets. So uh, mm. fun work looking into yeah. Oh, and then this journaling, journaling even um, for reflection. So that's more like a mindset uh, trick or a mindset tip. Again, we are going through so many things um, in life or as a developer. And if we mm. don't reflect on our th uh, stuff, we it just passes by, right? And we know yeah. that like, if we set aside, even if it's like five minutes a day to properly write down notes, journal can be anything. Um, we just learn 200 percent, right that awareness and it also prevents like making repeated mistakes that's super powerful yeah so if we're, if we're going to frame it around the whole tooling concept of this training uh taking the notes journaling your experience so you learn from your mistakes and and you know get things off your chest and remind yourself of things that's a tool in itself to make you more effective as a developer in your career as a person as a human whatever um but the key there is that it takes discipline. You know, it's not something that's easy to do. Just like learning PyCharm uh, or learning VS Code, if we're just plain Vim users, that that's going to be a challenge for us one of these days, right? Nope. Uh, so likewise, to get into the act of journaling, that's going to be a challenge if it's not something you do every day. And it just takes discipline to get into, just like any other tool. Yeah, it's all discipline. Same like adding documentation to your code, right? Most people don't really like the documentation part. It can actually set you apart as a developer, I think. It shows that you care about your code. Cool. Right. Thanks. Automation deployment. Python is just one part of it, right? But it might be 50% or less. And there's so much more around it, the ecosystem, and getting actually actual code deployed, right? So we yeah, just yeah. did a couple of bullets here. Um, I mean, the first one... Um, there's a static uh, thing about code as how it formats and being consistent in a team. So if you're not already looking into a linters, by all means, start doing that. Because I think, again, like what I said about the documentation is those details that really show that you care about good code. Yeah. So take a look at Black and Flake 8. And that'll, that'll make your life a little bit easier, especially when you're on a team. And as you just mentioned, Bob, you know, trying to make sure you're standard across the board. Yeah. So Black does it all automatically for you and you could put that in a pre-commit hook. So once you um, commit code, that it automatically formats it with Black. But for me personally, that's a little bit too much magic. So I'm still mm. running a comma F. I put a, an alias in here, which I have in my .vim RC. So I still do it manually, I guess, to kind of see what's happening and, and learn from the formatting. I kind of enjoy that actually. Are you using uh, Flake 8 or, or more like an automated tool for this? No, I'm using Flake 8. So it's something I picked up, oh, I'd say a year ago, I really started pushing myself to, I, I read an article about it. Uh, but yeah, that was now something that is just part of my standard pi uh, pipeline. Yep. Yeah, I like it. And 
I guess most of you guys do, but if not, um, use virtual environments for everything, right? Anytime you need to install dependency, you don't want to do that in your global space. Uh, you want to do that on a project by project basis. So make a virtual environment and, and that's the way to isolate your dependencies. Yeah, please. That should be something all anyone, whether they're new to Python, whether they've been doing it for a million years, everyone should be using it. Oh. Uh, testing, uh, automated testing. So first of all, have tests, but then it's really beneficial if you can have them run automatically on deployment. So Travis CI or any CI solution, I think you can set that up on Heroku, is really worth looking into because then when you push something, it can just run the code and, and send you an email if it fails. So again, huge time saver. And, yeah. and if you can learn it, this is something that a lot of corporations use. You know, So if you are looking to get into a dev job, this is a valuable tool to learn that's a great point that's kind of just the standard right mm. oh. speaking cool. of which then you've got heroku and aws so um both platforms and uh, along with all the other cloud providers and everything out there you know they do have their free tiers so uh if you're going to learn deployment you know go and do it it's valuable as, as we've said it's a valuable skill and you can practice on these platforms quite easily yeah Getting to know the cloud tools is super important and uh, can set you up to to host your own solution one day, right? It's um, what mm. we did with the platform. Yep. Host and, it on uh, Heroku. Yep. It's all Heroku. And uh, we put a 12-factor link there. Um, it's interesting to, uh, if you're going to start your SaaS or deploy anything to the cloud, then um, the 12-factor app um, is a good read. It only takes you 20, 30 minutes and it talks about um, keeping configuration in your environment, um, dependency we just discussed, um, all these best practices. Talking about deployment, then you also, it's beneficial to learn some Docker because when you join a dev team, you might just be handed a, a Docker image uh, container and you're just expect to, you expect to go with that, right? So yeah, <laughs> good here you go, know. have fun. <laughs> yeah. So you can at least, uh, uh, our recommendation is to at least have some familiarity with it, understand how it works a little bit. Uh, even if you don't remember without the documentation, I mean, that's fine. Just uh, at least don't, you know, glaze over with someone hands you one of those. <laughs> so understand what you at least need. Yeah. Then uh, for production faults, like, Obviously, you want to catch as much um, stuff locally when you're developing, but sometimes there are just weird edge cases um, that uh, return in 500. Of course, you don't want to have debug on in production, so um, <laughs> you shouldn't show the stack trace to the end user. But Sentry uh, picks that up for you and sends you an email. So there, are, there have been some issues that we've seen um, that were emailed to us by Sentry, and uh, we just... Yep could make our app more robust that way. Yeah, they were mostly uh, faults caused by me. That's <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> and last but not least, we'll uh, talk about SendGrid quickly. So that's what we use uh, to help with emailing on our platform. So uh, it's just wonderful little tool. Uh, we have it plugged into Heroku, don't we, Bob? So. Yep. Yeah, yeah it's so an add on. Add on. Oh. Yep. Yeah. And it just works well. Nice little handy tool. And and uh, I talk about our platform and the stack we're using in uh, this test and code episode we linked at the bottom. So if you're interested in learning more, then uh, give that a listen. Ooh, debugging. This is one. a fun one. So let's do a demo. Uh, Bob, you can bring it up. Yeah, okay. So what's, what's happening here? So this one's, uh, we're, we're going to look at PDB first, but... Uh, the first thing is, and you can pause the video and read through this script on the right hand side in Vim and see if you can pick it up. There's a little challenge, but actually I'm going to stop there and give you a second. All right. So if you haven't picked it up, the way this script is working, um, it's current, the, where it's broken, I should say, is that it's currently using the global variable of vowels underscore count. And by doing that, we're getting some unexpected behavior and we can use a debugger like PDB to catch that behavior in action and then make the fix from there. So do you want to check it in? Yeah, so this was from actual byte. And when I run the pie test against uh, this code, it fails, right? So the number of placements is way higher than uh, what we expect. 
And uh, what's happening here is that um, this function is called multiple times in the test. So I placed a breakpoint in the function and we can just see what vowel count is because it should be zero before every invocation of the function, you would think. Let's see what happens. So first time this function is called, yes, it's zero. So that's cool. And that's probably why one of the tests passed. Mm -hmm. Then I hit continue. By the way, you can just um, type H to get all the options. But a debugging course would be uh, <laughs> definitely something uh, we should do uh, uh, outside of this uh, video. Um, when I hit C or continue, I just um, go to the next invocation and let's see what um, this variable now holds. Ooh, 262, so not zero. So it's going to keep on counting. And then of course, bang. So the problem here is that the global, um, the problem here is that the variable is global, so it's not reset. So this is as simple as making it a local variable. Right, cool. And then it works, right? So it is a very simple example. Usually bugs are way more complex, but the debugger is going to help you a lot. So it's yeah. like of a timeout, you have all the variables and objects available at the time of execution, and you can start to inspect them. And and it's it's super helpful. So know yeah. your debugger and use it a lot. Not only for debugging, actually. You can also just put, um, when you're writing your test, what I often do is uh, put a breakpoint in here and just look at what the code returns and then write the test in my debugger, actually, and then copy it back to the to the module. So that saves you a lot of time. Yeah, it's a, it's a much more elegant way than just throwing print statements into your code. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which we all do, and there's, that's okay. It's time and place, but uh, learning this is much more valuable. Yeah, so we can quickly demo that probably as well. I put the breakpoint there. Now I'm here inside this test function and I can just inspect what I just got returned, right? And then this works, of course, right? Um, but yeah, you, you see the point, hopefully. Mm. So the next one we'll look at is the Chrome dev tools or the inspect element of that. So if Bob, you can bring up the browser. Yeah. All right, so here is a list of all of our bytes of pie. So all of the exercises that exist on our Code Challenges platform. Let's just say you were building a web app or you wanted to scrape this page, whatever it is you're doing, um, you might need to look or you will need to look at the actual code running this page, the HTML, the CSS, any JavaScript, that sort of stuff. Back in the day, it would have been much more difficult to do. But now with the Chrome Dev Tools, you can just inspect the entire page. So if you right click on an element and then click on inspect, it opens up this inspector on the right. Now, this inspector shows you all of the HTML code, but it's actually interactive in the sense that if you hover over any code in the right-hand side of the screen in the inspector, it'll highlight it in the main body of your page. So if you need to, I guess, hone in on a specific element on the page that you want to see the code for, uh, perhaps a URL to see where the link is pointing, or in this case, you know, just get the text from the link, um, this is where you go. And it's a beautiful way of doing it. It also lets you break down the page to really see what's contained in things like the divs and the tables and so on and so forth. You can even add them on the fly, right? Yeah, that's it. You can throw your own custom styling, your own custom, uh, <laughs> your own custom text. Yeah, you can really edit these pages as you're going to see what it would look like. It obviously doesn't commit, but you can throw these things in there. Here we go, background color. Yeah, super ugly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> super ugly. So yeah, well, you know, obviously what we're showing you here is very basic stuff, but it's extremely powerful when you're making any sort of web scraper and you really need to find things to pull down, especially when you're using, you know, uh, your 
R for requests, your request dot find all, all that sort of thing. Very helpful here. Yeah. I kind of stopped this. Can we just <laughs> spend some more time here? This is fun. Yeah. Now let's go back to <laughs> this. This is super useful when you're yeah, <laughs> scraping, developing, web doing de web development. Yeah. Cool, cool. So yeah, those tools are super powerful and uh, you should definitely have in your arsenal. Productivity. Ooh, our All favorite. Right. Maybe. Yes, our favorite topic. So productivity is an amazing tool. As we've said, this, this is abstract. It's not an actual tool like PyCharm or something. But the reality is, you know, these are all tools that you should have in your arsenal um, ready for the day. So the first thing I'll talk about is the Pomodoro timer. Uh, if you haven't heard of that, it's just the idea of getting into some deep work. So no distractions, nothing, get rid of email, put your phone in another room, switch off completely, set yourself a timer for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it might be. And for that time period, you focus on your task with zero distraction. Don't check your phone. Don't answer the phone. You know, make sure you get clean time and that's going to help you be way more productive. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's such a challenge these days because Slack, mm. social, they're all designed to, well, Slack maybe not that much, but it ends up happening is that you're constantly interrupted and um, that's very counterproductive, right? To get mm. any meaningful work done. So um, I love your Pomodoro timer strategy here that you're just 25 minutes, you're off the grid, just focusing on your task. And uh, it's amazing what you get done, right? In 25 minutes. Yeah. Just... And if... If you're a sucker like me and you have a smartwatch, don't use your smartwatch for the timer because your smartwatch is going to get the interruptions from your text messages. So yeah, get yourself... Yeah, your phone in another room. Uh, airplane mode is your best friend. Yeah. Yeah. Even use the timer on your computer, whatever it might be. Oh. Um, and then the other thing is like work on the right stuff, right? Um, so if you plan out your day, ideally like the night before, then you come in the next day and you're hyper-focused um, because... If you don't do that, it's very easy to uh, fall victim to to other people setting your agenda, and you you end up believing that that's the most important thing you do. So really, define what you're going to work on. Don't set like five to six things because then nothing's going to happen. Focus on one or two, maybe three things you're going to do, and do them early in the day um, when you have the most willpower. But if you <clears throat> plan it out in advance. It's way more likely that you're going to succeed. An hour, what is it? Ten minutes spent on planning, an hour saved in execution, right? So, yeah, exactly. And you just have this—you don't have that overwhelming feeling of the unknown when you start your day. If you start your day and you know invest twenty bucks and get yourself an actual diary like this, and when you use it, you plan it the night before. How good is it going to feel in the morning, knowing? you have your day planned out that you know exactly what you're going to do. You can roll with the punches of things happening. Um, and oh. so, but as long as you get those key things done, uh, which is moving on to number three, that's keep focused on your main goal, the bigger picture. So make sure those tasks that you put into your plan for the day are those key tasks that will get you to your main goal. So they may not all directly lead to the main goal, but as long as they're chipping away at it, you know, you're getting there slowly, you're completing these tasks. These are the things that are going to get you to your main goal. So always have that in mind as you do things. Yeah. Yeah. Busyness doesn't make you necessarily effective, right? I mean, you have yep. to work on the right things and often remind yourself and think like, even if you write out your goals every morning, it's just more likely that you hit them because your, your subconscious goes to work, right? Hmm. Um, now, when you get off track, it all happens, even to us. I mean, let's be honest. Um, <clears throat> a great way to get back on track is to do a time audit. I wouldn't do this every day because it's <laughs> it's pretty harsh <laughs> yeah. and revealing. Um, but if you're really completely off the grid, then a time audit can get you back on track because it's a bit like the budgeting, right? Wherever does the money go? Like if you start to note it down, you actually realize, oh, right. there, There's, there's where the time is going, right? Um, and it can be shocking, but that's good. So then you and the well, the the beauty of the time audit that I like is that it's yes, it's revealing. It points out things, but 
you know, it's that motivation to, to improve. It gives you that motivation of, wow, this is time wasted. Look how much time I actually do have in the day. So it can reduce that stress of when you get to the end of the day thinking, I just didn't have enough time. Yep. Yeah, client kind of related to that is the weekly review. Like to mm. set aside one day during the week, probably best on Saturday when you kind of wrap up the week and just look back, like what are your wins? Uh, what did you struggle with? Um, I have a question in there like, what you would you tell a mentee if they were struggling with the same thing, which kind of gets you to reflect what, what you can correct. Mm -hmm. And super powerful to not make the same mistakes again, like to be aware. I think we already said that with journaling, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah. So if you want to know more, we have some productivity articles and it's definitely something that uh, we're passionate about because it's kind of driving all the other stuff, right? Kind yeah, of the it's skills. I'm definitely a cup of tea. <laughs> right. Then um, we want to talk a bit about the Python standard library and leveraging external dependencies. You want to take this one? Yeah. Yeah. So the idea behind this one is that you don't always need to go to an external library to get what you need. The standard lib standard library, I should say, covers most of your needs. You know, I mean, you've got editor tools, you've got collections, you've got date time, you've got so many amazing different libraries that will help you get through almost anything. So we've listed out some of the key ones here that, that we like to use that we find useful. So um, take a look, go for it, Bob. Yeah, I mean, the standard library is really amazing. And that's, that's what sets Python apart, like it comes with better included. <laughs> But sometimes like you wanna you wanna definitely pip install something, especially like if you're using a URL lib, uh, you should definitely use requests or you wanna mark daytimes. Well, there's a nice uh, library that we had an article on recently, which is freeze gun. Um, you do data analysis, pandas can be an obvious choice. If you do web scraping, well, beautiful soup makes that pretty straightforward. And we just showed like, how do I, um, which is, a nice tool you can just pip install and leverage right so by all means standard library but sometimes you know there are there are really great packages you um you can just leverage yeah and and while they're useful i mean there's always you have to take it with a grain of salt you know every time you import something there's a tiny bit of overhead so um just make sure you're using the right tool for the right job and of course, if you want to contribute to open source packages, uh, you want to become familiar with PyPI and the whole process of creating your package and uploading it to PyPI. So we linked an article we just released that uh, will help you with that. Perfect. Oh, this is your favorite, I think, <laughs> teaching and documentation, right? Yeah, so the whole teaching side of it, the documenting, as we mentioned, with note-taking, um, it's super important that you document with your code and you document how it works. I'm not talking about just adding the comments in the code. I'm talking about how you share with your users, how you share with your team, how you share with the people that are going to interact with your application, your code, whatever it is. So Jupyter Notebooks, uh, a lot of people use that. This was a huge <laughs> response thing on our, um, on the survey. Uh, so that's obviously there, but my favorite is Sphinx. Um, I just, I don't know. I like it. I just like the way it looks, it makes things simple. And I've just always loved the simplicity of it. So if you have a look at Sphinx and read the docs, that's the sort of picture you get if you use Sphinx for your documentation. I'll hold you accountable now to add that to our reading list app. Okay. Can we cut this out? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, Definitely. Now we're holding Definitely. Holds you accountable. It's even better. <laughs> All right. I quit. <laughs> For blogging, uh, we use Pelican. Um, there are other static sites and generators. You have uh, Jekyll, which is Ruby, really nice tool. But we, um, when we started PyBytes, we, uh, we thought like, well, let's keep it Python. So we went with Pelican. And um, if you want to know more on how uh, to build your tech blog, we actually have a training here linked on, on this slide. So uh, check it out. Cool. Ooh. <laughs> Unstoppable, right? <laughs> Miscellaneous. Right. There are still some tools we couldn't fit under the other buckets, so we just put them on our miscellaneous category. Yep, there's just the dumping ground. So yeah. the first one uh, was one, Bob, you showed me this a couple of years back when we made the 
100 days of code in Python course, which was a mockaroo. So if you need fake data and you don't want to have to, no one wants to have to create their own fake data to pump into their app to test. So uh, go to mockaroo and there's all sorts of different filters and settings you can change to give yourself a data set that you can then analyze with your application or import into your application and so on. So very useful tool. Yeah, the one that stands out for us is uh, carbon.now.sh because as you probably all know, we uh, share a lot of tips and um, we often get the question like, well, how do you get those beautiful images? Well, the answer is using carbon.now.sh. Easy to use and um, really nice images. Yeah, great for presentations and stuff. Uh, The other one that I'll call out is Selenium. If you haven't heard of it, go look it up. Nice testing framework for web Um, It's just a beautiful tool. Absolutely love it. Uh, So we use it a lot for testing code challenges. Whenever we do changes to the the page and everything, we run those tests. So very cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think I spoke about that on testing code as well. It's uh, it's pretty interesting uh, how we use it on the platform. It's really cool. Yeah. Right. Those were the 10 tips. Um, But there's one more thing. Ready? You ready? I'm ready. Let's do it. (sighs) What did our community answer? So (laughs) if we just landed on this page directly, so what actually triggered this whole training was um, we asked you guys, like, what is your favorite tool? And um, we got how many, well, many, many, hundreds of responses, right? And uh, so we made this little word cloud on uh, what your favorite tools were. And uh, as we said at the beginning, the uh, the editor is is huge, right? (laughs) Yeah. Really jumps out. Straight away, they're the things that were mentioned the most. Now, what I will mention, you know, this is not 100% accurate. As as with all computers, you get out what you put in and you can see there's double ups in there. You know, like people who typed Jupiter differently. There are people who, uh, you can see Emacs is in there. I can see three or four times that Emacs is in there. <laughs> yeah. So it is, it is what it is. But at the end of the day, you get the gist of it. The uh, editors were most definitely the highest response rate so very cool that people are passionate about their uh their python editors yeah yeah and there's some other things in there like anki i think those are those memory flashcards it's interesting yep yep shout out to uh jason he uh introduced us to those a while back so really really yeah. cool I tried to get a snake but that was not available <laughs> just, just saying shame for shame Conclusion then like What's the main takeaway? What are the main takeaways from this training? Number one, learn your tool set. It makes you more agile and saves you a lot of time. So just like we mentioned from that quote at the start, sharpen the saw, you got to get this tool set going. Yep. It's the compounding effect of saving minutes over hours over, it, it really adds up. Also note that Python is only a small part of this, right? There are so many other things we mentioned, like deployment, cloud, all these other things that are not directly Python related, but we, you, you are expected to know them as a developer. Yeah, understanding this bigger picture is what makes you successful and makes you more robust as a developer. So this is definitely something you want to dive into. If you're only doing exercises, that's cool, but look further, look further. There's much more to the whole ecosystem you need to know. Um, then also it's very hard to retain all the info <laughs> that is thrown at you, right? The books, the articles, the, and then also being interrupted all the time. Right. So mm. having effective way to take notes and become a content provider to digest your learning, we see that as super critical. Exactly. Um, which right. nicely, uh, leads into the fourth one, right? Yeah. Better tooling makes it easy to share which makes you a more professional developer. So if you can share what it is that you're doing, if you can share your ideas, if you can share your code, uh, share what you're learning, all those sorts of things, this is what makes you more professional, more valuable, and, you know, just a more well-rounded developer. Yeah. Going to emphasize the tooling bit um, enough, but uh, always keep in mind why you're using the tool. So just learning a tool for the sake of the tool, like the shiny new object syndrome, that's not, not going to get you that far. So always have the goal in mind. Yeah. 
always analyze what it is you're using. If you feel like it's too bloated, that you have too many tools, you know, this is worth doing an, an analysis into and finding out what you can shed because sometimes you may not need them anymore. As we find the tooling so um, important and fascinating, we obviously write uh, quite a bit about it. So we just linked a couple of uh, articles here. Um, you can check them out. Uh, no surprise, there's Finn there. And the first one is the most generic one. Um, it has some more details on the tools we mentioned in this training. Go check them out. So last but definitely not least, in fact, probably the most important thing, knowing about the tools is one thing, but using them is another thing altogether. So you have to put these things into practice and this is where we come in. So what we want you to do is use this link. Uh, it's actually gonna be below the video, so don't worry, you can't click the video. Uh, go to this supply page and get on a call with us. So we wanna speak with you about how you can use these tools to become a more well-rounded developer. It's just super important while you're motivated to make this change, while you're motivated to improve, to be more effective, to increase your productivity, that you take advantage of this now and, and get on a call with myself and Bob, uh, because we'll walk you through it. We'll talk you through how you can leverage these sorts of tools, um, analyze your situation, and really help you come up with a plan to get some more success out of your career, out of your Python, and so on. Yep. As you said before, uh, Python is only part of the, the whole developer ecosystem. Um, so stop the exercise and we'll keep doing them, but there's so much more to them and um, we can bridge that gap and get you to a well-rounded developer level and the tools will be an important part for it. So yeah. apply below and um, we would love to talk with you on a strategy session, looking yep. into your career and see how we, uh, how we can help you. Exactly, too easy. Well, thanks for watching everyone and uh, hope you got a lot out of it. We look yeah. forward to speaking with you. Hope this was useful. Uh, thanks for watching till the end and um, yeah, stay in touch. Thanks. Cheers, Bob.